I want to welcome you. In fact, I want to give a special welcome to all of our online guests and our other campuses, Central Campus, Woodland Park Campus, and my brothers, Pastor Tommy and Pastor Dustin, our other campus pastors. Let's give it up for our family. Come on. Welcome. We love you. I love you. And I'm so glad you're here today, man. I want to start with the story. I want to start with a story about when I was a young, young lad. I'm 23 years old, just graduated college, and we had a sweet little baby girl and a little baby boy on the way. Now, um, life was golden. Life was great. Um, I had a great job I really loved, and I worked with a dear friend. <laughs> oh, my. Um, well, sort of a dear friend. I worked with a friend, and um, uh, his name was Jared, and that's not, his, that's not his real name. We'll protect the innocent and the guilty as well. Um, his, his, his name was Jared, let's say, and um, I worked with him, but we also, we also went to church together. Now, we went to church together. We worked together. We spent many many hours together. Like we didn't just work together like at the same business, but we were next to each other a lot. And, and we went to church together too. We spent many, many hours, hours together. He was a great guy. I mean, he was a, he was a stellar, a stellar guy. We were about the same age. He had a lovely wife. He was an amazing husband. He was a great dad. He loved Jesus with a passion. He worked diligently. Like he was a great worker. We should have been homies. <laughs> we should have been friends. Uh, but we weren't. No, I didn't like him. <laughs> yeah. And don't worry, don't worry. He didn't like me either. Now, I'm not, not cool, <laughs> but, but that's kind of how we went through life. We never talked about it. I don't know if you can relate to that, but we never talked about it. Um, we just worked together, walked through life together, not liking each other. And then one Sunday morning, then one, day, one Sunday morning, a lot like this morning, at a church, a lot like Radiant Church. In fact, the, this, the, the sanctuary was shaped a lot like the central campus that you've been there before, you know, a nice big arch. And, and one Sunday morning, I was um, up at the front of the worship center during this worship service, like the, we were all singing and praising Jesus, but I had just come up for, front to, to pray and God wrecked me. I mean, he just, he just wrecked me. Um, and I don't mean wrecked like a, pr a crying mess. <laughs> Not this time. I, I've never cried before, but if I do, I'll let you know. But <laughs> It was just my heart, like it was pounded hard, and it was not the timing I liked. It wasn't, it wasn't, I wouldn't have, I would not have picked this time. He wrecked my heart because God was prompting me, he was pushing me, he was nudging me, um, and he's, a, he's gentle, right? The Holy Spirit is gentle, um, but he was loud. Go talk to your friend. Go, go, talk to, go talk to Jared. Now, see, I was about right here in the front center, uh, a little to the stage, stage left, and I knew where my friend was. He was on the very front row worshiping God and with his wife and um, over to the left of me about 10 yards away, not too far away. And I knew that he was calling me to go talk to him. And all I wanted to do was like run the other direction. Um, I, didn't want, I didn't want to. I mean, it had been a, like a year at least, maybe two years. We had worked together, gone to church together, and I didn't want to move, but I did. And I was like, okay, God, if we're going to do this, you better come with me. It better be a we, <laughs> right? You, you need, you really, I don't, want to, I don't want to face this one by myself. And it may not seem like a big deal to you, but it was a big deal to me. And I got up and every step I took as I started walking over to Jared was like a step walking on my pride. Like I could literally like hear it crunching underneath my feet, like crunch, crunch. It was not, it was not cool. But I finally got over there to him and I tapped him on the shoulder and he's, you know, he's worshiping, he drops his arms and, and he, go, he looks at me and I go, Jared, I don't know why I don't like you. <laughs> I have no reason to not like you. I am so sorry. Will you please forgive me? Now that's like word for word what I said to Jared. And I was a little freaked out because he looked at me and I had no clue what was about to come out of his mouth. See, I felt like I was on a battle scene, like the front of the front lines of the battle, and I had no armor anymore. And I had just laid down my only weapon that I had, a fence or whatever you want to call it. I don't even know what it was. I never even, I didn't even know I didn't. I don't know why. He, I'm, I was just honest with him. Jared, I don't, I don't know why I don't like you. I, I have no reason not to like you. I'm so sorry. Will you please forgive me? And he looked at me, he goes, Mark, I don't know why I don't like you either. <laughs> I kid you not. He says this. I don't know why I don't like you either. I have no reason not to like you. Will you please forgive me? I'm sorry. Okay, so two grown men, about 23 years old, hugged. <laughs> I'd say a bro hug, but the truth is we held each other for a second. 
because it, there was true redemption. Like, it, it really happened. Like, redemption in, in a friendship in that moment. And we just, we hugged for a second, and then we, we, we stopped for a pat at each other, and then we just started worshiping because there was still worship service going on. And we just worshiped together. Now, friendship has never been the same. It's been healed. It's been restored. It's been 20-some years now. And, I mean, he still lives back in a different city, but we're, we're still friends to this day. And if we see each other, it's, it's the greatest thing. In that moment, now, see, I know that that's not a, it wasn't a life, it wasn't like a scary situation. It wasn't a life-threatening situation. I'm, I'm well aware of that. But what happened in that moment is that, I, that two guys in the early 20s saw God move in a restoration kind of way so that when there was a threatening situation at work with a relationship or there's a threatening situation in a marriage um, with a relationship or in a friendship or a work relationship, that we look back and I look back and I go, God, I saw you do it before, you can do it again. You've restored before and you can restore again. And Jared does the same thing. He can look back on that moment and he does look back on that moment and go, God, you restored before, you can restore again. Do it again. So today's message is entitled, Return to Cinder. Return to Cinder. And that brings us to point number one. Number one is deliver the mail to the correct address. Gossip about people the way you want someone to gossip about you. Yeah, Matthew 18, verse 15 and 16. So we have the teachings of Jesus here. Man, I love, I love to listen to Jesus. I mean, I love it. Let's, let's read verse 15 and 16. It says, if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go. And I'm going to stop right there because I'm just going to tell you a little story. I say a little story, a little part of my life. This is underlined. It is, it is highlighted in like three different colors in my Bible because it seems like I can't get past it without it jumping out at me. It's like he's speaking to me. If, you, if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one privately and attempt to resolve the matter. If he responds, your relationship is restored. But if his heart is closed to you, then you must go to him again, taking one or two others with you. You'll be fulfilling what the scripture teaches when it says every word may be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now then there's another teaching Jesus has. It's just actually a couple chapters before. It's Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24. And it says, so then, this is Jesus. So then, if you are presenting a gift before the altar and suddenly you remember a quarrel that you have with a fellow believer, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go at once and apologize to the one that you have, who is offended. Then after you have reconciled, come back to the altar and present your gift. Now, when you have someone that has, you have someone in your life, a friend, maybe it's a workmate, maybe it's a family member, God, Jesus is saying, if they have a problem with you, um, they have a, a, a hurt against you, or you have a hurt against them, you have an offense against them, to go to them. It can be spiritually paralyzing if we don't. In fact, it's more than paralyzing. I mean, it can be paralyzing, like in our spiritual life, just stop us in our growth with our walk with Jesus, but it can actually be in reverse. Sometimes I feel like when this, when this, when this holds us, it's not just paralyzing, but it's like we go in reverse with our relationship with Jesus, because Jesus is doing everything he can to get to our hearts to say, your relationships with each other matter. It's so much, so much. He's really trying to tell us how very important they are. When they talk, when Jesus talks about our pocketbook, I think he's trying to get our attention. Hey, your relationships with each other are so, so important. Leave your gift at the altar. Go fix it. Go, go, go to that person and then come back and present your gift to, the, to, to me. That, that, that's, man, he's really trying to speak to us. I mean, it's, it's so important how much you love each other. Don't complain to three other people about the problem. Don't talk about them. Talk to them. Now, in life, in life I, I feel like I, I've coached this so many times. And I always, think of, I always think of Lady Justice when it comes to offense, when it comes to, because offense can be so broad, but the truth is when, some, when someone's hurt me and someone's like, or hurt one of my friends or kind of just rubbed me wrong or ticked off or, and, and when I, and I talk about this with my leadership here at North Campus, with our youth leaders, and I can say, you will be so happy to hear that it's a drama free. And you know why it's drama free? Because we live out Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. It doesn't make it easy. Following Jesus isn't easy. But, it, but picking up the cross and following him may not be easy, but it's healing when we follow him. I always think of Lady Justice. Lady Justice, right? I mean, I always go like this, but the truth is she's holding the scales. She's blindfolded and she has a sword in her hand. Now let's talk about the scales. I just think about Lady justice when it comes to this. It's like we're always weighing. 
because we get hurt, we get offended, or someone hurt, or we hurt someone, and we know, man, I said that, that was a little off color, that was a little bad, that was, was that, did I slice someone's heart a little bit with that comment? Was it a little too, you know, was it just a little mean, and I didn't mean to, or, or, or the backwards, like someone hurt me? It's like we're always weighing, or we should, this is, how, this is my recommendation, we should weigh. And if it's light enough, okay, if the offense is light enough, and you can move on, forgive, and move on. I actually think of Pastor Kelly, what she teaches here. What did she say? Um, believe the best, forgive the rest. Uh, that's good teaching. Believe the best in someone, forgive the rest. In real life, that's real hard. And Pastor Kelly knows it. That's why she says it all the time. Believe the best and forgive the, wor- forgive the rest. And I think of Lady Justice. If it's light enough that we can forgive and move on, forgive and move on. But what happens when it's gnawing at you? And you have that person, that, that situation, a family member, maybe a, someone you work with, maybe um, a, a boss or, uh, or, or someone that's a peer, and, that's, and it's, it's heavy and it keeps gnawing at you. And the nighttime comes and you can't go to sleep. And it's the last thing you think of. And when you wake up, you think you're having a good day and it's the first thing that hits your head. Is that hurt, that offense? And a couple days go by and it's still there and it's still heavy. A weeks go by. Now, I've never had a week or two go by. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A month, goes, a month goes by and it's still heavy. Okay. I'm guessing that's when Jesus is going, hey, lay your gift down. Man, you're, my schedule's too busy, Jesus. You don't understand. I don't have time. Make time. It's gnawing at you that much. It's taking your thoughts. It's robbing your space in your head. Go talk to them. Go make it right. Do whatever it takes. Leave your gift. I, I want you to have such a powerful, strong relationship with each other that you got to fix it. Do whatever it takes. So if it's heavy enough to go talk to them about, Jesus is calling us to have the conversation and to forgive. And when it's light enough to just move on, Jesus is calling us to forgive. Either way, he wants us to forgive from the heart. When, it's, when, that, pro, when that problem is so big and, and he's co- prompting us, to have that loving conversation. Remember, the loving does not mean easy. Following Jesus doesn't mean that there's not a cost. There is always a cost. The gift of salvation is free, but following Jesus will cost us everything. Either way, either way, forgiveness, forgiveness. I hate hard conversations. Okay, I hate confrontations. I hate it. But you know what I hate more? I hate broken relationships more. I, I, I can't stand it. So we are called to deliver the mail to the correct address. We don't want the postman and we don't want the Amazon driver to stop at our neighbor's house and deliver the package there. And the same thing is true with you and I when it comes to some hurt or offense. We need to deliver it to the correct address. We need to deliver it to the right address. Take it to the right person. When we have a hurt, when we have a pain, when we have an offense, when we have that anger or unforgiveness, we need to talk to Jesus and we need to talk to that person. Not the prayer chain, not our mutual friend, not their boss, not our boss, not the sibling. We need to talk to them. Jesus did not say, hey, um, in Matthew, he didn't say, if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to a mutual friend and make sure that they understand your side of the story before they hear any other opinions. (laughs) Sounds fun, but no, 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 no. He said, if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one in private, privately, and attempt to resolve the matter. Deliver the mail to the right address. If you have a problem with a brother or sister and it's big enough to talk about them, it's big enough to, it's big enough to talk to them. Number one, deliver the mail to the correct address. Gossip about people the way we want someone to gossip about us. Number two, return to sender. Return to sender. Now, when my sweet wife, Joy, was an underclassman at Oral Roberts University, O-R-U, that's a Christian university, she found herself at the first day of school at the cafeteria, and she was having a grand day, and there was about, I don't know, 10 girls. I, 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 that number I'm not sure about, but this number I know. There was like, she finds herself at this table, at this Christian university, six, eight, I don't even, six girls, all named Joy. <laughs> Seriously. It's like she was at a Christian university in the 90s. Like someone, they really liked the name Joy. Like six out of eight. They're like, hi, I'm Joy. No way, I'm Joy. And then across the table, like, we're all Joy too. Like everyone's name was Joy. Now that story has nothing to do with this. 
<laughs> at all. But I like that story. The same day or the same, like that day or the next day in that same time period, she was, you know, when you're still getting to know people at a new school or a new class, she was um, at the cafeteria and she was sitting with a, bu- with a bunch of girls. There's like, I mean, less than 10, but there's like eight, uh, about eight girls and they're sitting around the table and just having a very normal, neutral conversation. And then it turns bad and it turns sour, you know, like milk in the fridge. And we all know this, we all, we've, all, we've all experienced this. Um, someone starts talking negative about a girl that wasn't there at the table um, and just kind of nasty about her. Now, Joy was listening. I can be, um, I can rest assured that I know that Joy was listening, just listening to, cause she doesn't, you know, still getting to know everybody, but across from the table, when this happened and this conversation turned poor, bad, negative about another person that wasn't sitting at the table, another young lady, and it's crazy when you think, cause I mean, when you think about Joy now, but I'm thinking they're 18, these are 18 year old girls. She's 18, and what she does is absolutely astonishing. It's amazing. It's awesome. It's life-changing. She, from across the table, while this other girl was talking, she goes, hey, you know what? I cannot wait for my classes tomorrow. I am so looking forward to statistics. I have been, I mean, I love math, and my first class tomorrow is going to be math, and I just cannot wait to go to statistics. It's going to be so great. Okay, love it. So in a very gentle, loving way, she returned mail that, wasn't belo- that didn't belong to her, changed the whole conversation to the table. She was gentle, she was effective, and she had no attitude of holier than thou. She was Jesus. She was truth with love. She was love with truth. She was Jesus. Now, we didn't even go to the same college at that time. We weren't married. We weren't even engaged. We we're going to engaged, get engaged a few months after that. She calls me up, she calls, Joy calls me up that night and tells me the story. And I mean, obviously it affected me. You're talking 20, 20 years ago uh, or more, but let's go with 20. <laughs> 20, 20 years ago. Um, I mean, it, it changed me. I mean, it, it just, what an obvious, amazing, loving way to be Jesus. That that girl wasn't going to receive mail that didn't belong to her. And the whole table changed the conversation Absolutely, absolutely amazing. The young lady followed the words of Jesus and the wisdom of Solomon, put it together, and had an amazing outcome. Let's read Proverbs 18.8. So Proverbs 18.8 in the NIV says, The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down into the innermost parts. The words of a gossip, man, choice morsels. That means they're delicious. Gossip is delicious. Proverbs 18.8, the same verse, but in the Passion Translation says, the words of a gossip merely reveal the wounds of his own soul. Ah. And his slander penetrates into the innermost parts, or innermost being. Now, if you're human, you probably like gossip, okay? So don't, you know, shed some, shed some guilt there. It's all right. Um, I say it's all right. It's what we do with it. And if, um, if gossip tastes delicious, it's what the Proverbs are telling us. It's, it, it tastes really good, but it goes really down and it really sours really quick. And if, you, if, 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 you, if we hear gossip that's negative, it even tastes better. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, and if it's negative about someone you don't like, have you ever noticed it even tastes even better? Like you already don't like them and then you hear something negative about them. It's like, oh, that tastes really good. <laughs> I mean, you may not think that. That may not be your thoughts, but you find yourself listening to it. Let's see, it, it goes in and then it, and then it sours. It goes in and it sours our heart. And it may not, you know, obviously physically sour our heart, but what happens in those moments is it changes the way that we look at someone. I mean, have you ever noticed that? You can hear something that's not even negative about someone, but maybe it's a tick or maybe it is a personality flaw and you've never noticed it before. But after that moment, that's all you see when that person walks in the door. It's like, Pastor Mark, he, have you ever noticed when you say the word Chick-fil-A around him? <laughs> it's like, he automatically looks at the closest Chick-fil-A in the direction. No, like, I mean, but it, it, the, the point is, it, that's not negative, I don't think. <laughs> it's positive. <laughs> I'll take that one. No, for the team. Um, but, but what happens is when it's negative, you could have never noticed it about someone. It could be someone in your family. It could be someone at work. It could be a friend. It could be your neighbor. And then all of a sudden, that's all you see. It's like, have you noticed that? And blank. And, and there, or that negative conversation. It changes how we look at someone. Stopping gossip is amazing, and it's a great thing to do. It's, it's a beautiful for our friends. It's beautiful for our enemies. And we are better for it. Now, my sweet wife, Joy, um, she... 
She is, the, she is the example of the master class, man. She, she could do a TED Talk on returning the mail that's when, it's not, when it doesn't belong to her. And I mean this kind of mail gossip, and I also mean physical mail. When the mail comes to our house and it doesn't belong to us, which happens every once in a while, she is like on it. Like she gets caught so quick, she puts a sticker on it, and she's like return to sender or whatever she does. I've never read it. But she puts it in the outgoing mail quickly. Because if she knows that if we don't put that mail in the outgoing mail quickly, it'll stick around our house for a long time. She is on it fast. And guess what, my friends, my family, the same thing is true when we listen to gossip. If we don't get rid of it quick, it gets in and, they, and it sticks around for a long time. But when we reject it, when we return, and I don't mean rudely, I mean sweetly. I don't mean, I mean like truth with love, like Jesus. But when we do that, when we reject it, or say reject it, when we turn it back, it changes everything. And we're not going to, it will change our, it won't change our heart or it will keep our heart pure. Now, return <laughs> to cinder. Number two, listen to gossip. Listen to gossip about others the way you want someone to listen to gossip about you. Proverbs 18.8, the words of a gossip are like a choice morsels. So they go down into the innermost parts. Now, number three, what happens though? What keeps us from delivering the mail to the right address? What keeps us from delivering the mail to the right address? What keeps us from going to the right person? What keeps us from laying down our offering and going to the person we actually have the problem with, the offense with, the unforgiveness with? Maybe it's fear of rejection. That can be, that can hit me. Um, maybe it's unforgiveness. That, that's a really good, good, good chance. Um, what about, um, will it make things worse? Will it make things worse? Um, if I go, I mean, it's already hard. It's already tough. If I go and I actually have this conversation, what happens? It's hard to forgive them now. What happens if I actually go to them and I have this conversation and then we hate each other even more? What was Peter chewing on mentally? What was he mulling over when he asked Jesus the simple question, hey, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? It's up to seven times. <laughs> now see, I don't know what he was thinking of. I don't know exactly what was going through his head, but you know what I do know? I know what Jesus was teaching on right before that. He was teaching on offense. He was teaching on holding on offense. When your heart aches, when someone's name is mentioned, does your t when your t stomach is turned upside down, when, when someone walks in the door that you have an unforgiveness towards or that, that bitterness towards or that, ugh, maybe we can relate to Peter a little bit more than we'd like to think, or at least I'd like to think. Man, I've forgiven them. I, I, Jesus, I've forgiven him seven times. How many times do I need to forgive him? And what is Jesus' words to Peter? What is his words to Mark? His words are, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven, Matthew 18, 22. Jesus is saying seven times, great, Peter. 70 times, great. 490, awesome. But if it takes 490 times, keep forgiving until we have forgiven from the heart. Peter, Mark, keep forgiving until you have forgiven from the heart. Now, Jesus follows this, um, follows this instruction by telling Peter a parable about the unforgiving servant. Now, this servant owed his master 10,000 talents. Each talent in today's wages would be $348,000. That's $3.48 billion. That's 60 million days of labor is what he owed. Now, what's Jesus's point? He couldn't pay it. It was unpayable. There's no way he could pay it. But what did the master do? The master forgives him. The master takes away the debt. Instead of throwing him to prison, he forgives him and lets him go free. But what does the servant do? The servant goes to someone that owes him 100 days. 100 100 days of labor compared to 600 or 60 million days of labor. He goes to him, chokes him, throws him into prison and, until he can pay the debt in full. Now, when the master finds out about that, finds out that he did that, he reinstates the whole debt, throwing him back in prison. And then Jesus says this to Peter in Matthew 18, 35. That's why my heavenly father, or that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now see that verse, those words of Jesus don't seem like his character, but they are. He's a loving God, but what's his point? His point is that we need to forgive as we have been forgiven. We need to give out grace like we have been given grace. We need to love someone, the people that have hurt us the most, as we have hurt him the most, and shed and throw and love and pour out grace and mercy like we have had grace and mercy poured on us. Forgive until you have forgiven from the heart. 
That's what he's telling Peter. That's what he's telling us. And, but you're like, I don't know how you feel, but times I go, man, but you don't know Jesus. <laughs> I don't think he does. He goes, yeah, I don't, Mark. I've been, I've, been, I've been hurt pretty bad. I've been slandered pretty bad. But you don't know, Jesus, the gossip that's been said about me. You don't know that deal that I missed in real estate. You don't know that person that hurt my kids verbally or talked bad about my family. He goes, yeah, I still forgive. Keep forgiving until you've forgiven from the heart. If it's seven times, great. If it's one time and you can forgive from the heart, wonderful. But if it's 490, keep going. Keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Keep forgiving. Satan doesn't care how he separates you from Jesus. You can be living a passionate full life for Jesus. Uh, that you're trying to change your world for Jesus. But if there's unforgiveness in you and it's tripping you, he doesn't care what's holding you back. He doesn't care what you're chained to. He just wants to separate you from you being who you can be in him. Complete, abundant life in him, changing your world, passionate followers of Jesus who impact our world so that the world can know of his love because of the love we have for each other. That doesn't just mean your best friend at church. It means everyone in church. It means our followers of Jesus that we love and that we know all over this city and all over this nation and all over this world. Brothers and sisters of Christ, he just wants us to be separated from Jesus, even if it's just unforgiveness, even if it's just a hurt, even if it's just an offense. Forgive until we've forgiven from the heart. Number three, forgive until we've been forgiven, until we have forgiven from the heart. Now, there are so many references to Jesus and his mighty men, or him referencing love, um, lo love people, love your friends, love your neighbor, love, love your brothers and sisters, like, like let so the whole world will know of my love. Like show them what, how, what my love looks like because of how you love each other. And this verse that, um, this teaching that Jesus in Matthew 7, 12, it's so great. We've heard it so many times, but we're going to talk about it again. And that's the golden rule. It's Matthew 7, 12. It says, so in everything, do to others the way, or this is what Jesus says, do to, uh, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do for you. For this sums up the law and the prophets, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't just sum it all up because it's hard. I mean, but that's so big and it's so amazing. It's so grand. But until we break it down into real life, and then it's going to be kind of one of the toughest things, but the most healing commandments or instructions from our Savior. Now, there is a true story of a young man that eagerly signed up to support his country and serve during World War II. He was so eager to serve, but he dreaded the day that he had to actually ship off. I mean, he could not wait to help with his, his brothers to fight with the allies in World War II. But he dreaded actually shipping off because he was an orphan. Now, he's about 23 years old, 22 years old. He's a young man. But he, sh he, he knew that he had no one, no one to even say goodbye to him. There was no one to write to him. There was there, no brothers, no sisters, no mom and dad, no aunts or uncles, no grandparents. He wasn't married yet. He had no one. And he dreaded that day because he knew that he was going to be so far and so many other people would at least have a letter coming every once in a while. So he had this crazy idea. He had this idea that he was going to open up the phone book and just point to the first name he saw. And he did. He opened up the phone book. He pointed to the first name he saw. And it happened to be a lady. <laughs> so he writes to her. And he's so excited because he's going to invite her and ask her to be his pen pal. He writes this. He says, Dear ma'am, my name is Private So-and-so. And I pray that this letter finds you well. I am headed overseas to join my, bra my brave brothers who are fighting for our nation with the allies. I humbly ask if you would not mind being my pen pal while I am overseas as I have no family. Below you will find the address which to send the letters to if you so wish. If you would be, for, oh, I would be forever grateful. I kindly await your decision. Now, a few weeks go by and he gets his first letter. And I say first letter. She starts writing him. And he is so thrilled. He ships off and they write so many letters. I mean, the story goes, and this is a true story, that they write each other over and over and over. Re, I mean, pouring out heart, telling of fears, telling the stories of life until the, the war is over. And he comes back and he's back home in the States and he writes his last letter. And this is what the letter says. Ma'am, I am so grateful and honored for the kindness that you have shown me. I will forever be in your debt. If you please, I would be honored to meet you and buy you a cup of coffee. Sincerely, Private So-and-So. Her response, I would be honored. I will meet you at the train station a day from tomorrow, and I will be wearing a yellow rose on my left shoulder of my coat. 
Now, he was excited. Anticipation, I mean, absolute. Like his heart was racing. He bought a ticket that day. He was at the train station early. He got on the train and he, you know, his heart was beating so fast. He could not wait. He was so, I mean, two years of riding this young lady and he cannot wait to see her. And he gets there and he, the train station, and after like the hours of, of, of traveling, and he gets there and the train station is packed. It is, there's people everywhere. People getting off the train, people coming onto the train, left and right. There's family. He's meeting. He looks everywhere and he can't find her. He looks to the right, no one. He looks straight ahead. He looks to the left. She, he's, he, she's not there. And his heart's starting to drop. And he's pressing through the crowd because, I mean, he's trying to just find this lady that he so anticipated to meet. And he looks through the crowd and then he finally sees her past a whole bunch of families in the back wearing the yellow rose. His heart, his heart leaps and then it drops when he sees her. She's older. Not at all what he was expecting. He gets closer and presses through and he sees that she's old enough to be his grandma with wrinkles starting to go around her eyes and his heart drops. But then he puts his shoulders back and he marches straight to that crowd and he meets her. He grabs her hand and he loves her and he thanks her and he dotes on her and he treats her with kindness. And I'm using the word dote on purpose. That's not a word my grandma would use. He dotes on her. He just, he appreciates her and just starts just going and going and going. And after she finally calms him down, he go, she goes, she, she says, sir, um, right before you got off the train, a young lady just gave me this rose and told me if you came up to me, a um, soldier by your name and, um, and, asked for, and asked for me that I was to point you right down to that cafe where she's waiting for you. Yeah, yeah. He treated someone... I mean, this soldier, he treated someone the way he wanted to be treated if she were 25. Like he was hoping for this young princess that he could court and marry. And with a sheepish grin, he thanks her, shakes her hand, and runs off into his destiny, right? And so the story goes that they were married and lived happily ever after. But the love, the, the real life golden rule what an amazing example of treating someone when you have one expectation. When you, because we have these expectations in life of how we want to be treated or what we are expecting. And when they're not met, what are we going to do in those moments? It's, we're always going to be a witness for Jesus. The question is, what are we going to choose? How are we going to witness? We're always being. Will we be Jesus with skin on? Will, will, will we love people with truth, with truth, with love? Will we be Jesus? Let's break that down one more time. The golden rule. Gossip about people the way you want to be gossiped about. Listen to gossip about others the way you want someone to listen about you. Forgive the way that you want to be forgiven. See, so many times in life we get stories mixed up with gossip. We get gossip mixed up with stories. See, our friends usually don't run up to us and go, hey, 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 you know that person you really don't like? Um, I'm going to tell you something that's going to make you absolutely hate them even more. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't happen. What usually happens is it's just, um, it's just an interesting story or it's a dear concern. And, and we soak it in and it changes our view. It's an opportunity it's an opportunity to be truth with love. It's an opportunity to be Jesus with skin on. Number four, when it's not juicy gossip, treat, no, I'm kidding. Treat others, number four, treat others the way you would like to be treated. Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, do to others the way you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I bring it back to this golden rule because I, I, I love the golden rule. I love this teaching of Jesus. It's really hard to live out sometimes um, and because it's so broad, but when we put it into our real life, into small situations, it can be really tough. But it's one of the most freeing things that we can do. And I love the story of the soldier from World War II. Absolutely, absolutely the love of Jesus. I mean, his heart drops and then he still goes and he treats with love, respect, just like she was the, who, he, who he was looking for. Satan is not scared of a brand new building on powers. He's scared of you becoming a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Yes. Satan is not scared of a beautiful building on Maze Land with a great, big, amazing remodel that looks absolutely gorgeous. He is scared of when a Christian with 
uh, that comes to the end of our day, when we come to the end of our day and we're here tired and we are worn, but we take the advice of Pastor Todd and Pastor Kelly and we are tired and worn at the end of our day and we break open our Bible just a little for a little time and go, you know what? I'm tired and worn, but I'm going to jump in. I'm going to pray. I'm going to gather my kids. Maybe you're single and you're by yourself, but it's the hardest thing to open up. But we open it up at the end of that tired and worn day. We gather our spouse, we gather our family, and we pray over them. That's what scares hell. Scare, uh, hell is not scared. The enemies of this dark world, they are not scared of a beautiful building in Woodland Park with jaw-dropping views. If you've never been there, it's absolutely gorgeous of Pikes Peak on the north side. It's gorgeous. What scares hell is when the weakest Christian puts, uh, gets a little bit of action behind a little bit of faith and prays the most bold prayer that may feel like it's the hardest thing to say, but God will move and move mountains. Hell is scared when Christians unite, stop having bitterness and anger towards each other and walk in forgiveness because that really is when God can move through the body of Christ. When we are passionate followers of Jesus Christ impacting our world. I believe with all my heart that today that there are going to be, there's going to be freedom found. There's going to be forgiveness given. There's going to be forgiveness um, restored. And there's going to be some relationships, maybe with a friend, maybe with a, a workmate, maybe with a family member this week, today, that God's going to move and freedom is going to be found in Jesus Christ. I have been praying for you. And I'm going to keep praying for you because I know God is going to move some mountains. He's going to restore some relationships. It's all fun until we have that person in our life with the unforgiveness or that hurt against. And I need to forgive one more time. Jesus, has, he brings such great, amazing grace and peace, restoration. And before, we're about to pray a prayer of forgiveness. But before we pray that prayer, I want to invite you. Maybe you're here today and you have not given your life to Christ. You have not experienced this freedom that we're talking about. This freedom that can only be found in Jesus. We say it often. The Bible talks about the sea of forgetfulness. It's the only thing God will forget. And that is our sin. He throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. The Bible says that our sins are as far as the east are from the, is from the west. That's a long ways. And he wants that freedom for you. And if that's you today, as he did his part, he lived for us on this earth. He died for us and his father, God, raised him from the dead. Our part is picking up the cross to choose to pick up the cross and follow him. It is indeed a choice. It is a choice to pick up the cross. We're always making a choice. The question is, will we choose to follow Jesus? Will you choose to follow Jesus? Today is your day of redemption, if you so choose. So all across all three campuses and online, I'm going to invite us all to bow our heads and close our eyes. And the only people that are going to be looking around are Pastor Tommy, Pastor Dustin, and our online um, director. We're going to be here for you. We are here for you. And I'm, the only reason I'm looking around is because I want to know who I'm praying with. I am here for you. You can grab me after service. But this is an opportunity for you to give your life to Jesus and experience true redemption. If that's you today at all three campuses and online, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. We're going to pray a prayer together, all together as a big family. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now just pray this simple prayer with me, and I'm going to invite the whole church family to pray it and re um, repeat it after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned, but I believe that Jesus died in my place. And God, you raised him from the dead. And Jesus, I confess you are Lord. Please be the Lord of my life. Wash away my sin. Please come into my life and give me the power to follow you. That is awesome. Wonderful. In Jesus' name, we all said amen and amen. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes home. And think what how heaven is right now. I mean, it's absolutely amazing because it's why Jesus paid the price that he paid on the cross was for you. Now we're going to pray another prayer. And this is, I do, not, I do not look lightly on this prayer. It's a prayer of forgiveness, a prayer of us forgiving. And if that's you, no one's going to have to raise their hand now. No one online, no one on any of the campus, you don't have to raise your hand. Just pray this simple prayer. And there's going to be a place that I'm going to leave a blank. And I may just say blank, okay? And that's where you're going to say their name. You're just gonna, you're gonna, you can whisper it, whisper their name of who we're going to forgive. And maybe, you don't, maybe this isn't your issue, maybe this isn't your thing, praise God. But if it is, if you have someone, 
I'm inviting you to pray this simple prayer with me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray this prayer. Say, um, pray this with me. Heavenly Father, please help me forgive as you have forgiven me. Help me forgive from my heart. God, I forgive blank. I give you my heart to mend and heal. I forgive, say their name, like you have forgiven me. I pray blessings over their life, over their work and family, spiritually and financially, and bless the relationship with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. Now, you may need to pray that prayer again, and that's okay. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep forgiving until they are forgiven from the heart. There's freedom there. There is such freedom there. Now, the last prayer I'm going to pray today, I mean, this is different. It's different for me, but I know that God's calling me. I'm going to pray over you because maybe God is calling you. Maybe he's tugging on your heart to have that tough conversation this week. Maybe he's calling you to have that, that, that conversation. Maybe it's unforgiveness or maybe there's a, a butting of heads or, or and maybe that's the case. And if that's the case, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be praying for you this week because as much as I hate hard conversations, oh man, I hate broken relationships even more. Will you pray with me? I'm going to pray over you. Heavenly Father, I pray for wisdom. God, that you will give, if there's someone here today that, they're, that you're pulling on their heart, that I pray that you give them wisdom regarding speaking to their friend or their enemy or their, their workmate, their family member in Jesus' mighty name. If it is your will, God, I pray that you give them clarity. God, that you will give them clarity to have the conversation and even the words to say. Give them strength and give them favor in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you will give them the words to speak with love and grace and give them ears to hear and ears to listen in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray that you go before them and that you soften hearts in all situations, in all people, in Jesus' mighty name as they have these conversations, that you restore in Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen and amen.